Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the History Effect, an online series that is produced by the History Council of New South Wales. My name is Dr. Kira Lindsay. I'm a historian based at the University of Technology of Sydney, and I'm also an executive member of the History Council. So I am going to be hosting tonight's first episode of our brand new mini series, which is called Careers in History. Well, it's brand new in the sense that it's online this year. We previously held it at the State Library of New South Wales, but it's really exciting to be working with this medium, whatever the circumstances. And the Careers in History series is a collaborative event that's run both by the History Council of New South Wales and the Professional Historians Association of New South Wales. So we thank them for their engagement and support. Careers in History is where we talk with historians, museum curators, researchers, and all sorts of other historians and history professionals about their passion for the past and also their journeys in history as professionals, their journeys in the history world. This is a series where we get to find out how they started, how they got where they are, and also what happened along the way. But first, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians on the land of the History Council offices with the Justice and Police Museum down on Circular Quay. I pay my respect to the Gadigal elders past and present, um, and also to the elders of Bidjigal country past and present, present who, which is, uh, who are the traditional owners of the area where I'm lucky to live tonight and right now. As most of you are no doubt aware, most careers are evolving, unpredictable adventures. My own experience has taught me that they are, that we are very often subject to what we historians call change over time. That means that they're susceptible to all sorts of economic, political and social conditions most of which are actually beyond our control. In fact, these days, the prospect of staying in one job for our lifetime, which was the likelihood for my parents, is long gone. And most of us are likely to have at least four professional reincarnations during our lifetimes. But I think that this is a great thing because it teaches us to become really good at responding to market forces, to technological innovations, to listen to our gut instinct and in the process to acknowledge that we're very likely to end up somewhere very different from where we started. This is a wonderful thing because as we're going to learn tonight, we get to develop skills in being curious and open-minded, in being flexible, in being resourceful. And we also learn that it's really important and to live professionally in a way that involves taking risks and perhaps even being a little reinventive. Um, so especially if you want to make your contribution, if you want to enjoy yourself and hopefully get paid along the way. And that's what our speakers tonight have learned to do by following their passion and their instincts and responding to opportunities. So tonight, there'll be an opportunity for all of us to do a little Q&A after both of our speakers. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat stream um, as they talk. And I'll do my very best to look at those and listen to them and, and try and cluster them together so that when each speaker finishes their talk, um, they, um, I, can, I can ask a few questions before we proceed on to the next speaker. And just a note also that we are recording this event and it will be posted afterwards up on the History Council website so that if you're desperate to go back and, and, and learn more of those um, pearls of wisdom that are going to come at you, then you can go to the website or direct your friends there. So um, tonight we're joined by Peter Hobbins, Dr. Peter Hobbins and Dr. Ian Stewart, who are both principals at the Artifact Heritage Services in Sydney, and both have very fascinating but quite different career trajectories to get to that, that place. Our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Peter Hobbins. Peter has wide experience working across local, national and international collections, including archives, museums and archaeological sites. His specialist areas span from science, technology and medicine, in addition to a lot of experience in public history, media and community outreach. 
So you can see that Peter's interests are probably very likely to touch on quite a few of your own out there tonight. Um, he also has won, had several significant fellowships and prizes, including his best, his co-authored book, Stories from the Sandstone Quarantine, Inscriptions from Australia's Immigrant Past, which won the 2017 um, New South Wales Premier's History Award. Peter's other published histories include books, academic papers, magazine articles, blogs and data sets on topics ranging from archaeology, inscriptions, landscapes, urban military, aviation and maritime. What haven't you done, Peter? For goodness sakes, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> so we're really lucky to have Peter here tonight. Thank you very much for coming along and um, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Well, look, I wanted to begin by thanking the History Council. Uh, you've really been a bastion of hope uh, and rising to the challenge of these times. And I think it's been amazing the number of seminars the History Council has pulled together in the last couple of months while we've been locked down and recovering. I also should point out that uh, the postnomial after my name in this first slide, uh, the MPHA member, means that I'm a member of the Professional Historians Association and I'd urge many of you to join that association in terms of improving your skills, uh, applying a, a, standard, a set of standards and also building your networks as well as historians or people working in and around the history profession. And I'm very pleased to say that our New South Wales website is just imminently going to be relaunched just in the next few weeks. Now, the other thing I'll say tonight is that, you know, in the context of our current traumas, it would be pretty easy to be quite dismal about the state of history. But actually, the presentation I'm going to give you is actually going to be quite upbeat and practical, I hope. <coughs> and how better to be upbeat than to start with The Simpsons? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look, to me, the essence of history can be brought down to this exchange between Sven Golly, the mesmerist, who attempted to hypnotise Homer Simpson at a uh, public event. Now, Sven <coughs> says to Homer, when I snap my fingers, you will transform into a a famous historian. And of course, those of us interested in the past are thinking, wow, which famous historian is Homer going to become? And of course, Homer says, look at me, I'm a famous historian. But what he next says brings us down to the crux of our profession. This is why we do what we do. Out of my way. That's the sum title. Um, so if even Homer can become a historian, that actually ties in very neatly with my own definition of who a historian is, which is someone who uses materials from the past to explain what it was like. And that's a pointed, pointedly inclusive definition that I like to work with. But unlike Homer, for most of us, there's no single moment where we transition from being a non-historian into a historian. It's a gradual process and we all have to decide where we sit on that, uh, that process. But to me, and this is what I wanna talk about tonight, the essence of being a historian is doing history. It's the process of research, analysis, but particularly communication. Now, there are many paths into history, and I think what unites our many diverse tracks through it is this focus on communicating, on actually sharing what we've researched in ways that connect with our audiences. Now, in that spirit, I think we have have to accept that there are very diverse meanings and implications of what a career might be. I've always thought mine was closer to the verb form than the noun. It's certainly been quite a rush uh, to, in the last 25 years of my working life. And I think the best illustration I can give you of that is to plot my annual income since I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in 1994. And I should point out while you're looking at the ups and downs of my income over the last 25 years that I didn't study history as an undergraduate. I stopped studying history at the end of year 11. In fact, I didn't come back to history until I was a postgraduate. So you're wondering just how it transformed my earning capacity. Well, let's have a look. This is where I began my master's degree. And this is where I began my PhD. Um, and in fact, you could say in some ways that the net effect of me studying history in the last 15 years has been that I finally, in 2020, returned my income back to the dollar value it had at the turn of the 21st century. So why on earth would I do that to myself? Well, quite simply, I love history. 
Uh, I love the process of research and analysis and communication. It was part of my previous career before I got into history, but I'm fascinated by the past and the ways that we understand it. And I'll give you a couple of examples here just from the last few months. So last December, I was on holiday in New Zealand and I went into a junk shop, as I often do, and found this pile of letters that you can see in the middle of the screen. The very first envelope I picked up had Carnegie Corporation written on the front of it. And I thought, oh, this is somebody who's got some sort of connection with medicine. So I leafed through the letters, I bought them and took them with me on holiday. And as you do as a historian, I actually read all these letters while I was on holiday. And then I wrote a finding aid about them and ended up donating them back to the University of Auckland Archives because it turns out that they were the personal correspondence of a former professor of chemistry at Auckland University in the 1930s and 40s. Maybe that's not everybody's idea of fun, but I had a ball on my holiday traveling around New Zealand and reading about his time traveling the world on behalf of the Carnegie Corporation in the 1940s. The second thing is the experiment that I helped run earlier this year, which was the social, social media campaign called COVID Street Archive, where we we're encouraging people to just document the signs of the impact of the pandemic on their everyday lives, particularly in March and April, but through into May and even to today. And I'm really pleased to see that, for instance, the State Library of New South Wales has picked up on that process as well. So two very different outputs, but both of them tied to my love of history. But really what's driven my passion for history is that I'm an inveterate writer. And this 1989 photo of me here shows me as an aspiring novelist on an electric typewriter. Now, I never dreamed at that point that I'd end up writing history. I really thought I was gonna write a classic piece of literature uh, until I realized I couldn't craft dialogue to save my life. Uh, but what I did find was that I had this real passion for sharing stories. And I think that's what unites a lot of my historical work. And in fact, the book that you can see there was called Stories from the Sandstone for a Reason. And I should point out that my girlfriend way back in 1989 was Kirsten Krauth, who herself has gone on to publish two novels. You can see the latest of them there. I'd urge you to go out and buy those because we need to support our struggling writers in all professions. Now, that creative impulse that led me to think about writing novels actually slid across from fiction into me becoming a professional writer for the next first 15 years of my career. So I worked in and around the pharmaceutical industry producing a whole range of materials and that gave me a great exposure to a whole range of different approaches. So I was writing brochures about conditions for uh, adults and for children. I wrote scientific papers and posters. I attended major medical meetings overseas and wrote reports back from them, as well as workshop materials and videos. And it was a real uh, baptism of fire, learning to write so many different formats. But of course, this is also why I was able to earn the sort of money I was on 15 years ago. Having said that, the internet also provided me with some different outlets for developing my own personal writing as well. Now I, and I have to admit this, I'm a plastic modeler. I like building little planes and tanks and ships and so on. And so some of the first history that I wrote was actually those introductory paragraphs like the one you can see there that just outlined the background of the model that I was building at the time. And so in fact, some of the very first items I ever put out into the world with my name on them that had the word history attached were these sorts of reviews. Now, as I moved along in my career into postgraduate study and particularly into my PhD, I had to start thinking a little bit more carefully about my personal brand. brand. In other words, what sort of historian was I going to be? Now, I chose to call myself a historian quite early on, partly because right from the outset, I was sharing or communicating the history that I was doing. And so I actually developed quite a range of outputs early on, including public talks as well as published articles. And the other thing I did was I started to position my expertise and try to build up a profile for myself. So as Kira mentioned earlier, my main focus is science, technology and medicine, but I've also developed a strong interest in writing about artifacts or beautiful things, uh, as well as working my way out into dealing with communities and how they value history as well. And as I went on, I found that sharing my passion for history, but also sharing the process of history was something that became really important to me. 
And I think for a lot of us in history, it can be quite a solitary discipline. We tend to do our research alone. We often, you know, some of us don't even want to publish our work. We just want to know that stuff as well. And one of the great advantages of working with archaeologists has been that that's inherently a team discipline, unlike history, where sometimes we have to drag people kicking and screaming into working with each other. Uh, now, because of my passion for sharing history, I ended up having to develop some other skills along the way, including public speaking, dealing with the mass media, and also learning to take on social media, which I was very reluctant to do early on, but I now have embraced. And that shift also is accompanied by a move from more didactic forms of communication, in other words, me just broadcasting them to the world, to actually trying to become more conversational, whether it's through dealing with audiences and workshops at live events, like the one in Tenterfield you can see here, or actually taking part in talkback radio or talking live with uh, fellow historians like my friends you can see uh, in the photo on the right. And certainly, you know, for instance, I've just recently published, uh, well, I've got a, a piece coming up on what we can learn from community histories of Spanish flu. And that was actually the focus of my talk for the History Council just a few weeks ago. Now, another major shift that I underwent in the last year was moving out of the university world and into industry. And as Kira mentioned, and as Ian and I know, Ian and I, know we, I work now for Artifact Heritage Services here in Sydney. In fact, it's been a wonderful privilege to join Artifact because Ian's been a fantastic mentor, uh, bringing me uh, up to speed with so much about the heritage world and about the practicalities of archaeology that I didn't understand before. So there's definitely still a lot I can learn as a professional historian. But even in the midst of that, I've still been trying out new outlets. So at the start of the year, I launched a 20 minute documentary on aircraft crashes in Australia uh, as a, one of the final outputs from my postdoctoral project. Uh, I've also been, for instance, publishing in magazines, including the Aviation Historian in Britain, which actually pays me 40 pounds per page for uh, content. I've been uh, putting a series of articles in Traces magazine, which is a really high quality product for local history and family history. And I've started developing a series of walking tours with Renaissance tours downtown as well. And again, I'm being paid for this. So this is actually professional history work. And maybe, just maybe, it will help me regain all that money I lost by my passion for history over the last 15 years. So wrapping up then, you know, heading back into that headlong rush of a career, I guess you have to ask, where do I think this is all going? Well, what I really aspire to is to transform my passion and my experience in history to becoming something of a champion for history and heritage across the country. And you know, I had the privilege of being on Australian Story a few weeks ago, and that was great fun working with the TV crew. And yet I still sometimes have to remind myself of what it is I do and what I think I'm capable of. So just last week, I had a call from a commercial television station saying, would you be interested in coming on on a semi-regular basis, you know, maybe every fortnight, just talking for a few minutes about an aspect of history? Of course, you'll get bumped if anything interesting happens in the news. But, you know, we'd, we'd just like to have some history as a little bit of light content at the end of the week. And at first I thought, oh, I don't think I could do that. And then actually in preparing for this presentation tonight, I thought, um, what's the point of my presentation? It's that we have the, those skills in research, analysis and communication. That means, of course, I should feel comfortable being able to put together a brief episode every couple of weeks to go out on national television. Why not? or as Homer would say, out of my way. So look, in the end, what I wanna say is that, you know, these are awful times in some ways. The formal study of history is under shocking threat, particularly at our universities. But that's not the only way into or through history. And in fact, none of the examples I showed you in my presentation tonight are traditional academic outputs. And so if I can leave you with a positive message, it's that you can career into history and through it by focusing on what and how you communicate the past. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. That was just terrific and, and really inspiring. Um, I'm waiting for questions to come flooding in. I think you've bamboozled them all with your, your wit and creative impulse. <laughs> and uh, so they're careening <laughs> in response. But <laughs> I've got a few questions up my sleeve. Um, it seems to me that um, like, if, I also didn't do history as an undergraduate. I did it as a PhD, but I kind of came in through the back door in my history training and acquired a lot of other skills along the way. But it hasn't just been skills and experience. It's also sort of been a personal 
or this position that I think has been important to me. Can you um, unpack for us a little more some of the personal qualities that you think are vital to being able to um, to sort of move through those different opportunities that have presented you along the way? Mm, that's a great question. Thanks, Kira. Look, I think the first thing to say is that just because I didn't study history doesn't mean that I didn't study history. So, in fact, I loved history through all of my life. I was constantly reading books and visiting museums. And that continued when I was an undergraduate. So I still was reading a lot of history. And what it actually meant was that by the time I came to approach my master's at the age of about 35, I had a very wide range, you know, wide ranging knowledge of history. You could call it promiscuous. It wasn't particularly disciplined and it wasn't particularly focused. But I did find that actually having a relatively wide knowledge, at least of modern history, I tended to define modern as a sort of beginning with about the Seven Years' War in the 1750s. My interests okay. moved on from that, but it was quite global. It spanned quite a lot of different areas. And I think that was really a good grounding to coming into history because I hadn't segmented my understanding as well. And it did mean that, therefore, I was open to lots of different approaches to history as well. I wasn't particularly caught up in cultural history or social history or technical history or military history, which I guess was one of my interests. You know, I had a, quite a wide range of interests. So that, that just meant I was able to come in with a, a sense of curiosity, but also I could see where the subjects I was studying fitted into a wider scheme. Mm, now suddenly we're being flooded with questions. Wow. So I'll just... Yeah as I'm, my eyes flutter with fear as I'm racing through these, I'll just quickly ask you, was there a particular moment where you thought it's time for me to step forward further? Well, my passion. yeah, look, um, it, you know, there's, there's a few steps along the way. I mean, um, funnily enough, you know, I, I mentioned my plastic modelling. Now, when I was uh, I, uh, an early graduate, I'd come out and started working. I thought, oh, golly, you know, there's no time in my life for any more academic study. You know, I've got two degrees. That's all I need. I don't want to do anything else. But the urge was there. You know, I kept thinking, oh, maybe I'd like to do some sort of master's degree or some sort of graduate diploma. And I looked at a few, but I kept thinking, no, I haven't got time for it. And then I found that I was staying up until about two o'clock or three o'clock every Friday night watching Rage and making model aeroplanes. And I thought, now... I can make the time in my life to do all of this. If I'm that interested in studying history, I can make the time to do that as well. So I actually didn't do a history master's. I did a master of medical humanities, which was a sort of a weird and short-lived qualification at the University of Sydney, but it did give me a chance to get into the university world as a postgraduate without any undergraduate qualification. So it was kind of a sneaky back door. But yeah, look, I think it's one of those things that we often think, I haven't got time to do that. My response is always, you make time for the things that are really important. Yeah. I really love the fact that you've got this curiosity, this passion, um, the creativity elements, the desire to communicate. I think they're all really valuable, kind of absolutely essential energies to bring to working in this field. But also, um, I, I would say that that generalist knowledge probably gave you a confidence so that you weren't too crippled by the self-consciousness that often comes with a little bit of academic training sometimes. No, I'd agree. And look, and I guess the other thing was, you know, I came to history after having been in the professional world for 15 years. So I was used to communicating at a professional level and having to do things to a certain standard, being, you know, getting up and talking in meetings or even at conferences and so I did approach that with a level of maturity and confidence that, you know, I wouldn't have made necessarily coming straight out of my undergraduate degree. But that's not to rule out those possibilities if you are just coming out of your degree. It just meant that I, I approached it a bit differently and I was pretty focused right from the very first essay. In fact, the very first book review I wrote in the very first subject I did in my master's, I published. And I was just always focused on yeah, getting it out there. Don't do this for study anymore. Do this for publication and I guess that's a, one of those wider messages about communication. Yeah I think that's really really important is what what is the motive that's compelling you to do your work and it needs to be better bigger and better than the uh, publish or perish um, mm. syndrome that we often hear within the university. A lot of people are asking you questions around your communication but I want to go back to one that I see at the top from um, Erica, which is about avenues for employment for people from non-speaking English backgrounds um, who are interested in diverse 
careers. That if just if you had any thoughts on that, I think that's a, a terrifically interesting question to ask in a immigrant society radio where there's often a, a focus on a particular type of um, national histories and yet mm. you know so much of what we do as historians is to seek to diversify the narratives to consider um, immigrant histories and different voices. Yeah that's a look that's another great question and I think one of my answers to that will be that actually especially when you come through the university system you only see a narrow band of what's actually done in history out there. And so that there are an enormous number of histories that are produced outside of that model. Uh, that includes, for instance, working in uh, local studies collections or local museums, uh, possibly helping write uh, specialist studies. Now, this may be of a particular community, say for a suburb or for a particular cultural group. Uh, and it may even just be uh, making sure that materials are uh, you know, broadly, historical materials are culturally available to wider audiences. I mean, it's pretty shocking that almost all of our history outputs are still only disseminated in English. And, of course, that tends to lock out other groups from uh, involvement. Now, you know, there are some really active groups like the Chinese Australian Historical Society. Mm. They do a fantastic program of events. They incorporate both English-speaking and Chinese-speaking and, and bilingual uh, members as well. And, you know, they focus, obviously, on the Chinese community mostly in Australia, but they also do look at, um, you know, Australians who travel to China and so on as well. So there are opportunities like that. You know, the, on, on that note, you know, we've just seen announced uh, just a few weeks ago down in Haymarket, there's going to be a Museum of Chinese Australia established uh, within the city of Sydney uh, at the old Haymarket Library. So there are opportunities like that that would open up, particularly for people from a culturally diverse background. Thanks, Peter. And I think also one of the things about um, having a career in an area like history is that sometimes you create your own career. You know, it's a little bit of what there is, a little bit of what's needed, a little bit of what skills you're developing, and you bring those all together to create something new. So perhaps, you know, that area of thinking about histories being um, communicated in different languages is an area for um, our questioner to think about as something that she might develop. And there's a, a few questions that have come in around social media asking you mm -hmm. to sort of um, discuss the extent to which that has played an important role in your career and profile. And also a question that I think would be quite a good one to end with, which is the practical thing of um, in your graph of the, the great up and then the great down <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. the the gradual steadying out and how um, how you've managed to deal with that practically. Because I think a lot of people who follow their passion are aware that they're going to have practical challenges, um, mm. but that it's worth doing it. But it's always nice to hear from other people on the breadline, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, why don't I, I start with that one and I'll come back to social media. So, look, it's always a bit weird showing your income to people, but broadly the, the point I wanted to make with that graph was actually that when I left university, I worked for other people for a while, but where my income really took off was when I set up my own company. And, you know, quite frankly, capitalism works. You know, if you're going to employ other people, exploit their labour, make money off the, uh, the work that they do for you, you can earn a lot of money quickly if you know what you're doing, if you know your market well. Um, and that... That was fascinating, it was fun, but I was never trapped in the money. You know, a lot of people can be trapped by a rising income. I actually didn't see it that way. I saw it as a way to enable me to do other things. So in fact, it's not that studying history made my income plummet. It's that I'd earned enough money that by the time I was in my mid thirties, I, I could comfortably reduce my income a little bit to, to pick up my master's degree and spend more time on that. And that ultimately I actually sold my shares in my company uh, so that I could take on a full-time PhD. Now, again, we don't all have the luxury of that. We often are not working on that model. But it is a really important point to think about the financial sustainability of what you're doing as well. So I didn't even do a PhD thinking it would get me a job. It wasn't my plan initially to become a professional historian. But gradually I thought, well, you know, once I did have a PhD, then I was looking at least sniffing around six-figure sums anyway, if not actually always reaching them. So, yeah, it, it, it's a tough call, particularly for midlife, to decide to back away from a major income stream, but that was a choice I made. 
And your story a, also reminds us, Peter, that um, you don't have to, that the wonderful thing about a career in history is that it is one that you can um, continue to develop and grow in well into your 60s and 70s, that it's not an age limited um, occupation at all. In fact, you kind of mature like wine in, in history. Yeah, I mean, one would like to think the cumulative experience and knowledge. I mean, and, and, you know, we'll hear from Ian in a minute who has, you know, a wealth, you know, over 25 years in the industry. So he's got an amazing uh, breadth of knowledge there. I won't, I won't foreground what he might say. We become living archives after a while, right? Living <laughs> <laughs> National treasures, I'm sure, I'm sure. So look, with social media, I want to say, you know, I'm 50 and I approached social media, say, 10 years ago, very dubiously. I was not interested. I didn't want to have any part of it. I thought it all sounded like a fad. And I very gradually came to Twitter in particular that I've been on Instagram as well. And I, I started using Twitter because of the project I was on at the university that led to that book about the quarantine station. And I started thinking, well, look, we need to be putting something out there in public. I'm now a huge convert and I've actually given talks on the skeptics guide to Twitter in particular. I don't think it, you know, it solves the problems of the world, but what I love about social media is that it's social. In other words, it's not a broadcast medium. It is actually interactive so that you've got a chance to converse with other people, share ideas, meet new people all the time, uh, build a base of following followers, but equally follow more and more people. And of course you can't keep up with all of them, but at least you actually can connecting with a much wider range of people than you could do in person. So for me, I found social media was really valuable networking. I've had a lot of people contact me through it and I've made contact with people through it who I would never have crossed paths with otherwise. And I just try to make sure that I don't use it for broadcasting. Yes, of course, I put out stuff that I do on there and you're looking for the, the kudos and the, and the recognition about that. But I also make sure that I return that favour and read and share the posts of other people put out there. So I've actually found it's been a real compliment to my life. You know, I don't invest massive amounts of my time in communicating through social media. You know, I don't, uh, I'm only on there maybe five or 10 minutes a day and I don't spend hours crafting my tweets. But I think definitely I now see any piece of communication that I put out in the world, whether it's a talk, a movie, an academic article, a magazine article, uh, you know, a conversation I'm having, a piece that it's on the media. Everything I do will now be embedded in social media. I'll always promote it through that means. And I make sure that I share that uh, by um, promoting other people's work too. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I think that's really useful for all of us to think about how we use social media and also that there's a, a kind of relationship of reciprocity that needs to exist in that, mm. that it is about giving back and, and not just self-promotion. There's a final question here from Laura, which, I, Laura, and I'm really... I think it's a great question to, if I can throw it quickly to you, Peter, and then incorporate it into your questions at the end, Ian, because I think it's a really important question, um, which is that she, Laura asked, she's interested to know about what kind of history-focused careers could be pursued for people living in regional and rural parts of Australia. Wow, yeah, I might throw that one to Ian a little bit more as well, because he's, he's done so much work in those parts. Uh, to the country, whereas I've only started doing that. But look, um, I would certainly say that actually the heritage industry, the one that Ian and I are both in, is actually one where you could uh, seriously contemplate a career in history because there are uh, people particularly working with local councils who do a great amount of work in terms mm -hmm. of um, both compliance, in other words, making sure that developments in the local area meet uh, the heritage legislation and respect the wishes of the community about preserving what heritage is important to them, and that's both Aboriginal heritage as well as non-Aboriginal heritage. Uh, and I guess the other side of that would be, you know, you could move across, you know, there are things like heritage architecture practices that you could be looking at. Um, but also, you know, there's so many wonderful local, uh, like local and regional museums and galleries and local studies collections that are actually out there. If, you know, if, you're, if you're doing library studies, for instance, moving across and doing some history there means that you're engaging with members of the community who are often wanting to look for their roots. You know, they might be Aboriginal people trying to work out their mob. They might be uh, somebody who's just moved to the area or somebody alternatively who's had ancestors in the area for 150 years and they want, a bit, want to know a bit more about their own family's heritage there. They're the sort of people you can help in a very practical way by actually doing day-to-day -day history. Somebody might just want to know, well, who owned my house before me? They're the sorts of places where 
you can actually still look for those jobs in local government in particular that might be really rewarding for you. Thanks, Peter. I hope that's been helpful, Laura, and a useful question for other people. And I guess it's about the idea that history is a form of meaning making, but it's also about community building. Mm -hmm. And so how can you use those skills to help build the community, perhaps by asking the community? I think, so thank you very much, Peter. And now let's um, move over to talking with Dr. Ian Stewart. Ian is a principal at the Artifacts uh, Heritage Services and also a partner at JCIS um, Consultants in Sydney. Born in Melbourne, like my good self, but we won't hold it against each other. Ian has been born, has been working in the area of archaeology and history and heritage since 1980. He's focused mainly on the East Coast and worked in government and private enterprise and has volunteered across the non-profit heritage sector. His work has encompassed Aboriginal, historical, industrial and maritime spheres of heritage. In his practice, Ian is never quite sure which hat to have on. Is it the history hat, the archaeologist hat or the geographer hat? He has a strong belief, however, that everyone who works in the Australian heritage sector should have a good, solid working knowledge of history. His particular interests are lie in landscape evolution and industrial development, particularly technologies, are how they're adopted and developed. He's recent, he has recently published on Macquarie's towns in the Newcastle defences and on wheat landscapes. So thank you very much, Ian, for being with us today. Well, wow, that's another hugely diverse um, set of interests. Uh, look, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm, my talk is a bit more specific because it, it's a bit more about focused on, on actually, I guess, where a lot of the work in history lies, which is, is actually in the area of um, uh, heritage. Um, titled it, um, you'll never make any money doing heritage or history or archaeology, which were words that my father spoke um, when I told him that I wanted to do um, archaeology and history. Dad really loved history. He loved the history of his area. He loved the history of our family. He invented an entire uh, genealogy when I was a young kid about us, um, the Stuarts. Um, we're still waiting for the... Um, uh, Scotland to uh, throw off the shackles of the English and invite the Stuarts back to run the country. Um, but uh, so he could have said that. And I suppose my career has been 30 years of proving Dad wrong. Um, my background is in archaeology and, and history at La Trobe University uh, in Melbourne. Um, I then did a master's in environmental science at Monash University. And that was primarily to because I was interested in Aboriginal heritage, there's a lot of things you need to know about the past, not only just Aboriginal people, but also changes in the environment, what the environment might have looked like 3,000, 8,000, 20,000 years ago. So environmental science was a very useful topic. I also got to do um, quite a bit of history in that as well. Um, and then I came up to um, uh, Sydney to do a PhD uh, at the University of Sydney, um, looking at at squatting landscapes in southeastern Australia. I've always worked and studied. I've worked for 10 plus years in government and then 20 years in private enterprise as a heritage consultant. From seeing mutton birds feeding on the water in Bass Strait to F-111s flying extremely low down the Hunter Valley and giving me a wondering which side of the road I should be driving on when an f 111s coming at you. I've pretty much seen everything in, in consulting. I'm here to give you one perspective on the role of a historian in the heritage sphere. Typically, a historian in heritage would be employed by a uh, heritage consultancy like Artifact or like someone like Gordon Mackay Logan um, or someone like Graham Brooks and Associates. Um, often they are either employed as a uh, member of the team, so they're paid, so on a salary, or they're sub-consultants, so they're brought in to um, tarnish uh, or add some, some light to a, a somewhat tarnished um, project. Um, I thought I would start by explaining a little bit about the context in which history is done, because it's a sort of specific history that's focused on 
certain specific things that are actually dictated by the way heritage is, is administered and run and thought of. You can see uh, uh, me uh, consulting with Godden uh, Mackay Logan or GML Heritage looking at a, um, a brickworks. So the fundamental document in, in heritage in Australia and pretty much floating around the world is the Borough Charter and the Borough Charter process. And there's three elements to it. Investigation to understand the, a place, assessment of heritage significance or value and management of a place to conserve uh, significance or significant heritage values. And essentially history starts to sort of fit under the first bit. Investigation under the Borough Charter process is getting all the information about a place to make some sort of decision about how important it is in the world. And so the investigation could involve, you know, historical research, but it is heavily tied to the actual place. It's not tied to something non-specific, it's tied to the place. And the reason for that is, is because we're talking in a legal framework. So it's easy to understand goods and it's easy to, and chattels, and it's easy to understand property. But if you're, say, thinking about something like, like sounds and smells, which can also be really important, um, they're not covered by legal things. They're not things that legally can actually be done. So they're not really part of this process. Um, the Borough Charter's real importance is the assessment of heritage significance because it, it incorporates a wide range of views rather than leaving it to a single expert. And before the Borough Charter process came along, people would go out, and people still do in Europe, go out to sites and there'd be an expert and he'd say, that's heritage and that's not. The Borough Charter process talks about all the different uh, processes and people that have views in it. So you may have archeologists, you may have historians, you may have community groups, you may have Aboriginal groups, and there's different ways uh, heritage can be uh, in, uh, significant. So in New South Wales, we have seven criteria, which are based on the Borough Charter criteria. And normally people would say criterion A and criterion B would be considered to be the history criteria. But in fact, um, there's history embedded in all those. For example, uh, an item is important in demonstrating aesthetic characteristics. There's a history of aesthetics. Um, there's a uh, special association groups for a group that may have particular importance uh, to a particular place over time. So there's, they're all sort of incorporated, so there's history in there. The key analytical questions, I think, are to do with the, whether the physical evidence has the ability to demonstrate some aspect of a place or a landscape's history. It has tangible historical associations, not just sort of like... Major Mitchell passed this way, but real physical asso associations. It has research potential to ask further questions about the landscape, and it has aesthetic qualities relating to its form. Does it look beautiful or, or ugly? Um, and in fact, there's a whole history of what we consider beauty and ugliness. So there's some documents here that I think, if you're an aspiring um, uh, heritage historian, you need to sort of have your, your finger on, uh, on um, the one is the, the Heritage Office Manual, which is the Assessing Significance Manual. Um, and then you've got the um, criteria, the Assessing Historical Association, the Assessing Historical Importance, which were pre prepared by um, the Heritage Office and the historians. So it, it gives you some guideline how you might actually do that. And then, of course, there's assess Assessing Significance for Historic Archaeological Sites and Relics, um, which, again, is more archaeologically focused. What skill sets do you need? Well, I think you need a set of familiarity with primary sources. You've got to engage with the primary sources. And they are things like land titles, rate books, sands and other directories, maps and plans, archival photos, and trove. I'm old enough to remember when trove wasn't available. <laughs> and I think when people write the history of, his the history, of history, in Australia, there will be a point where you say there was trove and there wasn't trove. And particularly the digital um, Australian newspapers. Uh, I can remember when we used to start work, we would really 
very rarely do newspaper searches on a systematic basis because it was so costly. It took so much time to go through all the microfilms um, and look for stuff. Unless you had some really key dates to, to hang off, you couldn't really speculate. These days, you can just put somebody's name in trove and, and, and all sorts of interesting stuff comes out. So you've got to understand these primary sources, and I think Peter and I would agree, you've actually got to know where they are and um, go to places like archives. Um, I was going to put a Google Maps directions to Kingswood um, up here, but I thought that might be a bit insulting. I think you also need to understand the standard secondary historical sources, such as the historical records of Australia, the official war histories, and key local histories. Um, they're really important documents that people often don't refer to. Um, and they're, they're there for you. People have done the work, people have thought about it. So it's very helpful uh, documents to use. But then you've got to actually critically understand how primary and secondary sources might may be biased or skewed towards one point of view. Um, and the classic case, and I think there's uh, something online about this where Andrew Wilson discusses some watercolours where the watercolour of a particular site has actually been slightly altered uh, and composed by the artist so that you, you think you're looking at something that looks like a dead record for a building, but it's actually been slightly altered because it makes a better composition. And of course, familiarity with the Heritage Office guidelines. But a lot of people can do that sort of stuff. Where a historian adds value to it, is what I call context is king. This is where the historian's skills in actually doing history, understanding the broader context, the pattern and flow of history, the bigger picture, because often one finds with heritage histories, that they're very focused on a particular place and they often find it difficult to understand that place's position in the world. And I'm going to give you a, a little example of this. There's a particular piece of equipment called a disappearing gun. It appears on fortifications in New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland and around the world. Um, when people were doing early military history, they were very focused on the peculiarities of their particular place. And so there are at least six reports on um, disappearing guns, which sort of claim primacy for their particular area. And three of them exact claim to be the exact first installation of the disappearing gun. Now, obviously you can't have three first installations. But what they have never done is really engage the whole history of British fortifications. And in fact, if you go around the world where things are pink, you will find that there are fortifications that the British Empire installed that all had disappearing guns. They were actually relatively common um, rather than unique. And you need to sort of put that bigger picture in your assessment of the particular uh, item that you're looking at. So that's just simply one example of it. Um, hopefully, no, I haven't. Um, hopefully, there's other things you can look at. For example, I've just read Patrick Joyce's work on, on social history and um, in, in Britain. And a lot of that stuff, a lot of that trends and um, thoughts about how British social history in the 19th century evolved really applied in Australia as well. We're all part of the, 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 the colony. We all have similar, share similar ideas. There's a context of things to be put into. Now next we talk about something historians love, time. We all love time. When you're working in heritage, time is actually called billable time. It's in 15 minute slots. And I put in here a time sheet just to show you what you're expected to do. This is something that you may, may find very onerous that you actually have to account for your time, both to your employer and also to your employer's um, employer, the, the, the person who's contracted the work. They need to know that you've actually provided value for money. And, you know, as I said, surprisingly your employer and their clients will want to know how you spend your time. You need to think about how you're spending your time. You need to learn skills about strategizing your research. You may only have eight hours to do research that you know may take a lot, a lot longer, but you actually need to use that time wisely to um, go down various tracks, to work out which archives like you to have the best uh, information. So that's a sort of set of, of, I guess, cunning skills that you need to do. Most 
historians after a few years have got a really good sense of where you go. If somebody comes to you with a problem, you know pretty much which archive you might find an instant solution to. Writing. Peter's obviously heaps more, more experience than, than I. Um, in this, he, he writes and writes and writes. I sort of prevaricate a bit, but these are the tools for writing. The Australian Style Manual, the Oxford English Dictionary, the Chicago Manual of Style, which will help you with your footnotes, Fowler's Dictionary of Modern English U Usage, and the Macquarie Dictionaries of various quotes, although I'm, I'm sometimes not entirely 100% happy with the Macquarie Dictionary, but, um, you know, these are the documents that you need to have access to. Um, they form your tools. Writing is really important in doing heritage. It is absolutely communicate your ideas and your train of thought. If you're, um, the client may not be particularly interested in your work, but the regulators and the people who are looking at whether you've actually done the right thing or whether you've actually just written what the client wants you to write, um, are going to look at the argument. They're going to ask why your site, why you thought your site was the way it was, why you thought it was important, how it related to things, what your sources were. And it's absolutely critical to, to have that information in your report so that people know how you've come to your conclusions. I think everybody realises, and it should be actually written in your report, that historical events change, uh, perceptions of historical events change and historical resources change. So some archives suddenly may make things more available. Um, we're seeing this situation with the National Archives and the um, uh, John Kerr papers. You know, they may change our perception of the, the dismissal. Um, so we need to say in our reports, I've written this report at this particular time using these particular sources. This is what the, the conclusions I've drawn based on what, what evidence. So it's absolutely critical. And finally, and, and, so, and speaking as someone who actually has done a course called multidisciplinary organisation, um, the Borough Charter says, conservation should make use of all the knowledge and skills and disciplines which can contribute to the study and care of a place. And, we, and that means you are going to be working with a whole variety of different disciplines who may take different views of things, um, who may have see things in different ways. And typically, if you're um, working in heritage, you're going to be dealing with architects. You're probably going to be dealing with archaeologists. You may be dealing with Aboriginal communities. You may be dealing with engineers. Um, so there's a whole range of different disciplines and you form a multidisciplinary team. And the key factors, I think, are recognition, respect for the competence of each contributor to the team. You need to have clear definitions of goals, tasks and responsibilities and clear communication. And those are really critical things that you need to bring to your work as a heritage historian. So I think I've probably run out of time. So I'll pass the matter, pass the whole thing over to um, Kira for um, questions. Thanks, Ian. That was um, just terrific. I liked how chunky and focused it was on kind of different documents and the borough charter. I've been to borough and I'll tell you what, anyone who can make a charter in borough is an impressive... An impressive I believe, believe uh, I was there for a revision of the borough charter, but I believe the original borough charter required a, a fairly large and a substantial amount of wine. So, um, <laughs> I've heard there's a lot of drinking that happens in Barra, perhaps because it's so dusty there as well. We're talking about a, a, a coal town, a, a copper town, wasn't it? In, in the copper, the yes. Yeah. Um, and I was really struck while you were talking, particularly in that last slide, that the work that you do is um, often involves um, people, stakeholders with great investment but often coming around a very contested space so that there's a, deal, a great deal of sensitivity and carefulness that's also involved in this, um, this kind of work. Yeah, I think, it, I think it is. I mean, we, without wishing to sort of go into the specifics, but um, in my career, I've worked quite a lot with uh, human skeletal remains. And um, one, one of the things when I was working in Victoria, we did was um, we were dealing with a, a historic cemetery and um, 
there was a bit of a question about what are we going to do and how are we going to approach it? And I simply said, well, we'll take all our guidelines that we do use to deal with the Aboriginal community sensitivities and we'll just apply them to the, to the sensitivities of the, the European community. And that worked really well. Lots of consultation, lots of discussion, lots of understanding that people would find burials and the, 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 the idea of perhaps a scientific examination of human remains um, very intrusive. So there's, there's all those sort of angles and, and human remains is one of the, the, the really flashpoints. You've got to actually spend a lot of time um, talking to the community, working with people about the sensitivities that people have because it's not just simply the scientific view that might say, oh, this is a wonderful source of DNA and we can understand this and we can take these samples. But it's also people might find that incredibly intrusive to them. So um, there's a, there's a lot of uh, sensitivity to that. And I think that also comes with dealing with, you know, other disciplines like architects and stuff like that. Um, you've stimulated a lot of questions, Ian. And one of which is, um, how can historians start to work in this field? Is it about networking? Is it word of mouth? Are there place where, places where um, opportunities are posted? And when people are... Um, wanting to promote themselves to work in this sphere, what sort of qualities do you think that they that are you looking for? Well, I think that um, uh, there's a number of, of, of ways of doing things. Obviously, networking and the PHA and the History Council seminars are, are good ways of, of doing that. I think that from a client's perspective, from a potential employer's perspective, I think having you know, demonstrated skill sets um, help. And, and oftentimes, and, and I was sort of don't want to bash the unis, but oftentimes the university don't give you some of those skill sets, but people like the Royal Historical Society um, and the archives themselves often run seminars, mostly orientated towards family historians, but don't be proud. Go and learn from these things. You know, I learned about conditional purchases in, in um, New South Wales by going to a seminar that the, the um, archives uh, ran. And it was just, I still use the notes today. So there's that sort of thing. Put yourself out there and also try and write stuff. People are really interested in your writing skills because it's a huge issue. When we have consultants coming into Artifact or looking for, work, for more full-time work, we are looking at their writing skills because it's a, it's a huge issue. Okay. You know, historians write and write and write and write. Yeah. So reading and reading and writing and writing could be one way that people who are interested in moving into this field can start to build up their muscle strength. Yeah. And is, is volunteering also something that is available to people to do, say, how, I mean, people always want to go on digs, don't they? Yeah. Volunteering's, volunteering's become, I mean, look, archaeology was very much a sort of, um, uh, it was two ways. You, you, you did your university degree, but you also gained experience in a sort of mentoring way. But that stopped a little bit because um, major projects these days, there's a lot of occupational health and safety requirements, which they charge us for. So, you know, you could spend a day... Um, Sitting in a in a uh, with a whole bunch of other people in fluoro, um, learning about your site and um, and and being inducted to work on it, but you know it actually costs people money to do that, either your own time, but also sometimes they charge you for the privilege of working on the site. So that puts a, uh, has put up a huge barrier, mm. um, but. There are other ways of volunteering. There are other local historical societies, local studies collections, um, where you can go and, and learn those skills or engage with the documents. So there's plenty of vol volunteering. Um, well, at least the Murray's just said the City of Sydney Archives and the State Archives both have volunteering programs, and that's often a, a very useful route to mm. go down, um, uh, so long as you're not displacing paid professionals from their jobs, I suppose. That's the other, <laughs> other problem that people... Uh, and, and you showed a very scary-looking software before um, with billable time on it, and it occurred to me that there's a, a lot of project management that um, good consultants need to be pretty adept at. Are there... Um, a, a, people have been asking questions about online courses, long, short, 
um, that you might um, advise that you might. Look, I, I, I think that some there are some courses around, like. Um, I think WEA were offering um, on being a consultant. And that's sometimes, those sort of courses are actually quite useful. They may not have anything to do with history or the sort of work you're doing, but they have some basic principles about starting out. For example, um, I, I can remember having discussions with, with students at, at um, Sydney University um, about the sort of work that was was they were being asked to do. So they were being sub-consultants on projects, how they should charge, what they should consider doing, um, what their roles are, what their obligations are, that sort of thing. And so there are, are courses around on, on being a consultant and that's probably a useful sort of exercise to see how the how it's generally done. Mm. Um, there's... there's uh, other more specialist courses on project management that you can do, but you know, project management can you can go down a, a sort of rabbit hole with that because people become project management gurus and they're sort of in love with the software rather than actually managing any projects. But um, they have really great plans. So um, there's all that sort of thing. When I did environmental science, one of the things they they actually ran was a number of courses to try and pull that all together. To sh there was multidisciplinary organisation was a sort of course that brought in a whole lot of things about project planning, um, about working with other disciplines. And I'm not sure whether their course, whether that course is actually, or similar courses are run at, at um, uh, around Sydney, but that's the sort of thing to, to do. And it's probably something that we should be encouraging um, people to universities and such to run so that people know how to work in teams. Yeah, absolutely. So being being able to work in a team, being able to collaborate, and seem to be very crucial qualities yeah. for potential candidates. Well, yeah, I think you can see that in Peter's work as well. I mean, he, he he's obviously um, the sandstone work was at, at the quarantine station was was a collaborative um, uh, project. So there's there's working together in teams is really really critical. Mm. So. What do you love the most about the work that you do? Oh, I just like the diversity. Mm. I think the thing is that um, I, I can uh, be sitting in my office one day and, and somebody will ring up about something and it may well be a, a crisis. Mm. Um, it may well be just somebody saying, what do you know about this? And there's a whole diversity and you can suddenly be doing one thing and then the next minute you're off doing something else. Mm. And, uh, yeah, what, what, sorry. I'll... What quality do you think is most important? There's, what personal quality has been most important for you in your work? Uh, don't panic. <laughs> that's, that's, that should really be our tagline for 2020, I think. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really important because I've, I've seen it, you know, you, you, you've just got to let everything and... and, and um, and just let it all happen. And as I said, don't panic. And there, there are various instances I can tell you about situations where I've seen, seen that work. Um, and I think also possibly be yourself, you know, as a sort of, and, uh, as a sort of historian and dealing with the community and people. It's important to just to be yourself and not be, you know, the historian from Sydney, particularly in rural areas, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're, just the, you're just the person going out there asking people about things that they are experts in. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you, you go out there and, and, um, and, and try and engage in their culture and, and um, uh, just be yourself and be honest. Yeah. And I found that in particular working with Aboriginal communities, you know, they have um, huge bullshit detectors and they, they know when you, you're not honest. Yeah. Um, and that's... Uh, that's through bitter experience. So I think that um, you know you can if you go out there and work with work in the community, you've got to be yourself. Yeah, what a powerful note that is to end on. To um, always come from integrity and and you know and enjoy your own authenticity, whoever you are. There's an opportunity for you to make that contribution, to follow your passion, to to be creative in the ways that Ian and Peter 
shown us tonight. And to be true to yourself um, and to use things like the Borough Charter, other guidelines and suggestions, social media, to use them in a way that's collaborative, that's considerate for other people. Um, and, you know, by sort of attuning yourself to those, um, those good motives, those good intentions, that kind of level of integrity, it's inevitably going to come together, but it might not come together quite in the way that you anticipated or quite at the time that you anticipated. But those are the sort of ingredients that um, I think Ian and Peter have shown us tonight are really integral to not only um, charting a path for yourself through the history world, um, but also enjoying yourself self along the way and making a contribution. So a huge thanks to Peter and Ian for um, a really enjoyable conversation and uh, and also a thanks again to our co-collaborators, the Professional Historians Association of New South Wales. Please come back, come and play with us at the History Council with more events and again great thanks to our conveners, um, Catherine Shirley and Cass who have worked behind the scenes to make this happen. And once more, to Peter and Ian, thank you.